Welcome to Why So, the podcast where some of your favorite sewing personalities and rising stars share what motivates them to create using needle and thread. I'm your host, Jason Prater, and with me today is Angela Wolf. She is an entrepreneur and fashion designer, and I am super excited to get to speak with her today about why she sews. So welcome to the podcast, Angela. How are you today? Good, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're busy and we really appreciate you taking time to share with our audience. And, you know, I'm sure many of them know who you are already, but for those that don't, would you mind telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm Angela Wolf and I have Angela Wolf Patterns, the host of It's So Easy TV show, which is where most of the sewers probably have learned to to watch what I do. But um, I design clothes, design patterns. I have an online academy and I am in the sewing world all the time with live shows. I love it. (laughs) I went from fashion designing for customers to helping sewers learn how to sew their own clothes. That's awesome. That's awesome. So sewing is that, I mean, this is your full-time gig. I mean, you don't do anything else uh, as a job other than in the sewing world. Is that correct? Yeah, no, this is, this is my job (laughs) and it's a lot of hours each week, but you know, between putting patterns together, live streaming, teaching online, all of that has just, it feels it's a full-time job, but it's, you know, when you can go to a job and you love it, I don't think it gets better than that. No doubt. No doubt. Well, so do you consider yourself uh, like I always ask this question up front. Do you consider yourself a sewist, a seamstress, tailor, quilter, crafter, omni crafter? I mean, where do you when you introduce yourself or define yourself as a sewer, which of those terms do you most often use? You know, I kind of just boil it down to a fashion design and sewing entrepreneur because I I actually capture many of those from just sewing. The word sewist has always bugged me just personally. (laughs) So I just go with fashion designer because you're going to have to put your garments together anyways. But embroidery, I love quilting garments, embellishing all of those things. So there's really not one word. I would say sewing entrepreneur would be, that would sum it up. Awesome. So how'd you get into this? What, what, what got you into sewing in the first place? I mean, how far does, does this go back to like childhood? Is this something you picked up later in life? I mean, how'd you get started sewing? <laughs> I hope your podcast is about three hours, but I'll make it. <laughs> no, I started. Take as sewing. long as you want, Angela. <laughs> I started sewing at a very young age. My mom sewed. I was the oldest of five kids. And so I would always try to sew along with her. And then it got to the point where I would sneak her fabric out of her stash and sew my own things. And I sewed all through high school. I went to college actually for engineering and business. But when I graduated, my parents gave me a sewing machine and a serger. Little did they know (laughs) that I would actually launch a business within the next year designing custom apparel for uh, women. And then that business grew to designing for women all over the world. And I ran that business for over 15 years. Wow. And that was I, I that was a great aspect, but a whole different thing than I do now. And I actually won a fashion design contest at the American Sewing Expo in Novi around 2008, I think. And from that became the host of It's So Easy. And I still just thought this was just a gig, you know, I'll just, you know, teach on It's So Easy TV. Well, the show became so popular that I would get emails and people would say, what pattern are you using? Well, they were my own design. So these people didn't want me to sew for them. They wanted to sew their own. And then finally... I made the corporate decision to change my entire business to invest in some very expensive software, learn how to digitize patterns for the home sewer and change the whole thing to teaching and catering to them. That is, that that is quite the journey. So, wow. Yeah. There's a whole lot packed into that. So your mom, was your mom, your, your primary teacher, uh, or did you have some other formal training in there? I mean, how, how did you learn how to, how to do all this stuff? My mom was my main teacher through the years, my younger ages. Then I would try to learn the patterns myself and I didn't, I couldn't understand what they meant. So I would have my two sisters just chalk me in on a piece of fabric, (laughs) look like a crime scene. I'd sew it together and come up with a great outfit. And then, you know, this is pre YouTube days. So I would just, every book I could find, I would read and study and then practice and then read and study and practice. So basically from all the knowledge that all these other awesome sewists, fashion designers had put out there. I studied their work and created my own. That is, that is so cool. So what was the first thing that you ever made or what do you, what do you first remember making and and how did that go? What what did that look like? Well, 
two things come to mind. One, when, when the first, elf, the first thing I ever made were these little like wrap bandanas. That was when I was like four years old. And I only know that from photos, but four I. Four years old. So you were actually using the sewing machine at four years old. This was not hand sewing. No, this was sewing. I think wow. I scared my mom to death, but she would sit right <laughs> by me and let me sew. That is then, fantastic. I transitioned to, I think it was seven, I was seven or eight and I made a skirt and a vest at summer camp and I was the biggest tomboy you've ever seen. So to make a skirt and a vest for me was, everyone was like, really? (laughs) But I'd still just get on my big wheel with my skirt. (laughs) That That was one of my first outfits. I love it. So were any of your friends sewing uh, through all of this time? I mean, you started sewing so early and sounds like you never stopped. I mean, were, were any of your friends into sewing or was this just your thing? And what did your friends think about that? You know, none of my friends sewed that I knew of. And in fact, in high school, when I started designing some of my own clothes, it, sewing was not a cool thing. Like now I consider it these young, uh, young people that are sewing. Now they're so fortunate because sewing is kind of so trendy and you can yeah. create your own designs. But at that time, if you were sewing, it was not a cool thing. So I wouldn't tell them that I would sew the outfits. I remember a dress I made and everyone said, where did you get that? And I said, I can't remember. My mom and I went shopping. I wouldn't even admit that I was sewing them. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I, that, I hear both sides of that. Sometimes, you know, it depends on who, who the folks hang around with. But I, I get that a lot that, you know, sewing just wasn't all that cool whenever I started. That's too funny. What, what do you like sewing? What, like, what's your favorite thing to sew? I mean, if you, if you weren't doing it as a business, what would you be sewing for yourself? You know, it's kind of changed through the years. It used to be couture jackets. I loved a Chanel style jacket with quilted lining with luxurious, luxurious fabrics. But now, you know, from being at home with COVID and even though I was still working the whole time, every our wardrobes have changed. I never thought I'd be wearing tennis shoes out <laughs> in public because <laughs> I was always trying to wear cute shoes. And now it's like tennis shoes, leggings and a really cute sweater. So any of those I design jeans. I love making my own jeans and pretty much anything, everything I wear, I make. Wow. So so literally you never buy stuff off the rack anymore. Right. Except for lingerie, because I have to have some luxury lingerie and purses I buy. But as far as everything that I wear and my husband and I fish, I fish on a fishing team. I make all my own clothes for for that and um, embroider our hats. I mean, kind of like anything that we do. I have That's my hand. fantastic. I was going to ask, I was going to ask you about that. So you spoiled it for me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I saw on your website, you know, all these different uh, magazines that you've been in and been a part of. And then I see this looks like you on the cover of an angler magazine. What's up with that? <laughs> that is true. That, and actually the fish on that photo is not photoshopped. Everyone emailed me thinking it was photoshopped. It was just the angle of the camera. It was a huge salmon. But no, my husband and I fish salmon tournaments all summer here on Lake Michigan. And then in the winter, when we used to fish sailfish tournaments all through the Keys, but now we condense it a little bit because we're both working so much. But yeah, I love fishing anything, any day on the water. And actually all those books I was telling you about, I was reading when I met my husband back in 94, he would carry my backpack with all my books (laughs) so I could study while he's fishing. I would just lay on the boat and study all the sewing things. And then that week I'd go home and test them all. And then we do it all again the next weekend. Oh man, I love that. I I always ask the question, if you're not sewing, you know, what other kinds of hobbies do you have? So we just kind of, that's usually one of the last things we talk about. We just kind of jump right into that. So (laughs) fishing, did you fish before you met your husband or is that just something that you guys share together? You know, I, I loved being on the water. I loved being out in the sun, anything on a boat. I mean, I would go fishing. My dad would always take us, but I don't think I literally did much except put a worm on the hook. (laughs) But now I'm very active into it. It, I, it just kind of osmosis. Yeah, that's too cool. So you, you mentioned, you know, that you sewed all throughout college, but you were going to school for more of a business degree. Or uh, at what point did you decide and say, yeah, I, I think I want to have sewing as my business? I mean, it, it was a great marriage of things. It looks like since it was already your hobby, you're already good at it. But how did you how did you make that decision? Were you thinking something else prior to that? I mean, like, did you did you have an idea what kind of business you wanted to be in? And then all of a sudden something clicked or how how did that go? You know, 
Really, no. When I went to college, I loved math. So that's why engineering was kind of the goal with that. But I didn't even know what type. I just knew I loved math. And then through college, I was really bored and I really just wanted to start working and start my own business. So when I got the degree, I condensed it to business, organizational management to have the degree and start a business of some sort. But really, when I got out of college, I applied for a couple of jobs and I really, none of them interested me. In fact, I had an interview with a man, I won't mention his name here, but very well known across the country, very, had a lot of companies. He offered me so many different options and I don't want to sound ter- like a spoiled brat or something. I wasn't, <laughs> I was seriously thinking of each job that he offered me and I was like, mm, no. And I remember he said, what do you want to do? I said, you know, I would like to design clothes. I'd love to work for Ralph Lauren. Do you know him? (laughs) That was kind of like, uh, yeah, no, but, (laughs) and I remember my dad called me the next day and he said, so how, where are you moving? Where's your job? And I said, actually I'm not. And, um, I'm going to start my own business. And the guy actually, we sat for two hours and he talked, we talked and he said, you know, I think you'll do fine on your own. And, and he also told my dad the same thing. She will never work for someone. She will, she's going to run her own company. And eventually took 30 years, but yes. (laughs) That's fantastic. So how how did you, how did you get started? I mean, did you have some seed money already? Did you, was this just a bootstrapped kind of operation? Yeah, no, no seed money. And actually when I talk to people who are trying to start a business in sewing, if it's alterations or custom apparel, uh, I always try to inspire them and say, Hey, you know what? I really had nothing. I just got out of college. I started dating my husband. He came over to my apartment one day and he's like, what are all these clothes hanging? Like he's I'm like, oh, I designed this one. And it was kind of my collection. I wasn't, you know. And so finally, after he saw the studying I was doing, uh, maybe about six months later, he said, why don't you have a fashion show? And I said, well, Who am I going to invite? Well, he had lived in this town a long time. And he said, hey, I have a list of ladies. We'll tell them to invite their friends. He said, I'll pay for the wine. So we offered them each one glass of wine. The restaurant was a beautiful restaurant overlooking. We live on Lake Michigan, so overlooking the lake. And of course, I limited to one glass. That was all I could afford on my budget. (laughs) And it was myself, a really good friend and my sister, just changing clothes in the bathroom and then doing like a just a quaint fashion show through the restaurant. The restaurant didn't charge. They thought it was wonderful to do this. And from that is how I grew my business. I gained a few customers there and it just kept monopolizing. That's fantastic. So so did you like take orders there for, for people to say, I really loved that outfit. I would like for you to make one for me. Did you, did you literally take orders from those folks? I did not. The first one, I did not. I just wanted them to see what I did and to see the work, the quality, to see if they liked my style. And from that, I said, if you would like, you know, something, call me. And from that, people called and had some dresses made. And I was still very, not nervous, but very, you know, (laughs) I'm thinking, okay, I sew, but is it as good as some of these beautiful $2,000 gowns at Nordstrom's or anything like that? So I was very nervous about that. And so it took me a few times, my first customers, bless their heart. I'm still friends with many of them. (laughs) I learned my fitting techniques on them. So I literally learned fitting on so many different types of bodies because you can't learn that from a book. You can only learn that on someone. So through time they would tell their friends, then they'd order some more outfits and it just went from there. That is, that is so neat. So did you ever uh, design for any large clothing labels or or department stores or anything like that? Or was this all just custom work? It was all just custom. There was a period where I was really seriously considering coming out with a ready to wear line. And I kind of chose which stores I wanted to approach. And then, you know, I did some more research on it and I really wanted to focus on the higher end custom clothing. And I was busy enough as it was with that. So to take a step back and do this other avenue, it just I don't know. I just, it really didn't interest me as much. So I I loved the custom work one off. It was expensive. I mean, the women paid, you know, quite a bit of money for these outfits, uh, but they're beautiful. I still see, I'll still run into a few ladies wearing one of my couture jackets or something like that. I I just love it. (laughs) That's fantastic. So you were designing for a living and, and sewing custom clothing and you decided to go to the American Sewing Expo. Janet Prey show out in Novi, right? Yes. And did you, so you you entered a contest there and this is what springboarded you over to the consumer hobby side? Is that how that went? I didn't even know there was a consumer hobby side. I 
<laughs> I had been for all these years, so that at that time it would have been about 15 years, designing in my studio. I, I first worked out of my house and I moved to a studio. I mean, I worked 12, 14 hours a day and just never knew any of these other shows existed. So I saw this in a magazine for the contest. I thought, well, Novi, that's only three, four hours from me. I'll enter the contest and go. And I entered the contest. And I actually became one of the top, I think it was 10 or 12 contestants. I can't, I can't recall, but, and then it was basically like a live project runway where you had to design an outfit. They gave you a challenge. You had to go through, buy fabric there and design an outfit in front of people walking by you in two days. And that was it. So I never knew these shows even existed. I was like, whoa, look at all this. This is amazing. (laughs) That's fantastic. So, so you, you, you win this contest. How, yes. how, how does it go from that to hosting a, a show? I, I know Kathy Stoll and I, I know uh, it's so easy. How did that happen? Well, to be honest, I didn't win the first year. I was the audience favorite. And then I went back to my job and ran my custom apparel business. And then the following year, my mom called and she said, are you going to enter? And I said, no, I'm not entering. And she said, why aren't you going to enter? I said, because I didn't win last year and I'm busy. And she said, you have until five, because there was an entry deadline of when you could get your outfit in. And she said, you just finished that other outfit, drop it in the mail. I said, mom. And she said, well, I just want to go with you. It'll be a girl's sewing weekend. Okay, fine. So I dropped an outfit. And then the second year I was also accepted into the top 10 or 12. And then that's the year that I won. So, and you know, my mom got the flu and she didn't even, she couldn't even make it. So (laughs) So you missed out on your girl's weekend. No. Yes. So then the following year, because of winning, you were allowed to have a display of your garments. So I had a display. I put together a quite extensive display of 20, I think it was 20 some outfits of all couture jackets, gowns, everything. And at that show is where I met Kathy. And she was toying around the idea of starting a, a TV show on PBS for fashion sewing. So she asked if I was interested in auditioning to be the host. And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> that sounds exciting. And that pretty much we finished 21 seasons last year. Wow. Mm-hmm. We kind of, I guess, sulky missed out on that. We, 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 we used to sponsor a lot of PBS sewing shows. We had a, had a chance to hitch our wagon to you, doggone it. Didn't do it. <laughs> That's okay. I still like you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. Well, I'll switch gears on you back to more maybe your, your personal life. Obviously, sewing is your living and, it, and it's... Um, your business and you've done really, really well with it. What, what about sewing personally? I mean, most of the people that I talk to in the interviews that I've done so far, you know, a, a, a big theme there is always hand handmade gifts and sewing for other people. Is, is there any particular time where you've given a, a handmade gift or, for, or made something for someone from a personal standpoint uh, that's particularly memorable or holds some kind of special meaning for you? You know, there are, but I think more memorable than that is a teaching on a, what I'd call pro bono basis, but I have a group of young women here in town, the young girls and women, I would just say they, there's a handful of them, they're all friends and I, and they wanted to learn how to sew and they know that I charge quite a bit when I have events at my studio. And I said, you know, I think we should just sew for fun. And teaching them to sew just as like a fun thing to do for an hour. We get together an hour a week and I'm watching the girls from seven to 38 years old, designing their own clothes, sewing their own clothes, helping them make gifts for, I just helped one young girl. She made a gift for her young sister who her birthday's this weekend. She turns five. And that to me um, is just, that fills your, everything that you've been given, you're giving back somehow. Wow, that's awesome. I, I, what, what an answer. I, I haven't had that one before. We always talked about, yeah, I made this wonderful t-shirt quilt for so-and-so, or I did this or that. But what, a, what a cool thing, giving back through teaching other people to, to enjoy your hobby. That's fantastic. Wow. So what, what are some of, the, some of your favorite sewing things? I mean, you know, we have to have fabric and thread and all these things, but what are some of your favorite sewing tools that you just can't live without that are just your absolute must-haves? <laughs> well, I have to, and I'm not trying to plug myself on this one because I didn't invent it, although I did design my own. But the Taylor's Clapper 
I learned about that in an old book years ago, like way back in 94 when I was studying sewing for sewing and pressing your seams open, pressing your hems up. And I remember bringing my clapper and it was a June Taylor clapper onto the set of It's So Easy. And after a couple episodes, I remember Kathy Stoll saying, that thing is gross. <laughs> I mean, it was discolored. I mean, I had used it for literally 15 years every day. <laughs> and so I went on to try to buy new clappers because you like that's the most important part of sewing is the pressing, in my opinion. And they didn't have them. They didn't carry them anymore. Their patent had run out. And so I, I said, you know, okay. I talked to my attorney. She said, yeah, you can't patent it, but you can go have some made. So I went to my local builder and I said, I need a, to have a clapper made. And he's like, I don't do lights. I go, no, I'm not talking about clap on and clap off. I'm talking about a clapper. And you just see this guy. He is a, I'm a custom clothier. He is a custom woodworker. And I'm asking him to make this little piece of wood <laughs> for pressing. <laughs> And he did for a while. Then he, he said, you got to get somebody else. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> and I'm still having to manufacture, but that is really the most important and the best tool. Even my husband uses it when he's pressing his pants uh, to get that nice crease down the front. That's my absolute favorite tool. That and the seam ripper. <laughs> they awesome. kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. I love, I love, I love stories like that where, you know, something just completely unexpected <laughs> <laughs> you, you work with a local artisan to make something and, and become mm -hmm. successful with it. How, how cool. So you've been in this industry now for, for quite a while and are one of many, you know, strong women that have been successful turning their passion into uh, a business. Uh, we mentioned Kathy Stoll and, and people like her that have made a really good business in this industry. I, I got to ask you, which sewist or makers out there have influenced you in some way uh, or that you admire for some particular reason or that have helped you in some way within this industry? Is there any, any one in particular that stands out to you? Well, you know, the first one that comes to mind, uh, she was really a stronghold, June Mellinger. She worked with Brother at the time. And she's also worked on sets of many shows with Kathy, but she worked, she worked for Brother. She's actually the, the one that introduced me to Brother that I'm a brand ambassador for and, and have created classes for their new machines, things like that. She actually is the one that I met on the set of the TV show because she was there because Brother was a sponsor. We became friends. Uh, and just her mentorship as far as she knew where I came from as far as designing. Then she knew I was buying all this expensive software to start doing pattern designing. And even though that wasn't her field, just her wisdom of the sewing industry, the sewing industry is, it's really huge, but it's small in some sense, I would right. say. You know who all the players are. You know who a lot of the talent, the, the ones that are well-known, you know, the fabric companies, the sewing machine companies. She knew all of this. And I learned so much from her, which really helped me to grow my business from the TV show and from my relationship with brother and then into the patterns and other companies that I've worked with. So she would be the one person that I would say really was a huge influence for me. So cool. I, I hear lots of stories like that. And I think it's because so many people in our industry are just good people at heart. I mean, they are literally the salt uh, out there. Uh, so, so many people, even competitors that are so willing to share information and help one another. It's, uh, it's, it's a neat industry to be in. Uh, I, personally, I, I've had that question so many times that this is my 28th year with the company. And I hear, you know, friends of mine asking, you work in boy, now what industry? This, the <laughs> sewing? People actually still quilt? Yes, they do. And it's quite a, a neat industry. And But the thing that I always come back to is I like the people that are in it. It's a, it's a good industry to be in. So yeah. I think June, June is a great representation of that. She is. And you know, it's hard when you say who's one, it's, I couldn't list just one. I'm just saying one of the first, but like Janet Prey, Kathy Stoll, all of these all of these women, and there's many more, but that, those were the three key ones at the beginning that really helped my footing. I learned a lot from them, things I did want to do, things I didn't want to do. And, you know, it helps to have that mentorship, even if they weren't intending to be a mentor, they're in, in my list, they were, are still. <laughs> Very cool. So you obviously garment sewing seems like that's your thing, but is there, is there some other kind of sewing, some technique 
some something that is like on your sewing bucket list that you've not tried? <laughs> not yet. I, I mean, because I try as soon as I see something cool, I have to try it. But I love embellishing. And I always have since even uh, when we got married, I hand beaded my entire gown. And there's a lot of beads on there. So I love hand beading. And then embroidery, when embroidery came out at first, I thought, yeah, I don't want to do that. And then I tried it and it's completely addicting. So at the quilting, I'm not a big quilter, but I quilt my fabric before I sew it into a garment. So technically, I mean, I'm not a technical quilter, but embellishing fabrics to make a design, that's my, I love that. So when they come out with something new for embellishing, I'll be there <laughs> testing it out. <laughs> Very cool. Well, what are you sewing right now? Like what, what, what's something that you're working on right now? Actually, speaking of jeans, I just am wrapping up an online class, how to sew your own jeans. There's over 200 of us women sewing jeans. It is so exciting to see people sew jeans because when you think of jeans, you're like, ooh, if that this comes out bad, it's going to really look homemade. <laughs> not that homemade's bad, but when you're sewing garments, homemade is not really the word you always want to yep. use. Uh, so we are adding rivets today, and now I will have four new pairs of jeans to wear, and I'm very excited about that. <laughs> cool. Now, what, what platform are you teaching that on? You know, I have, I started my own academy, Angela Wolf Academy. It's an online academy where I teach online courses. I have a fashion sewing club where we actually get together three times a month to do live classes. I just found it to be such an easy way to connect with people. It's too hard. Well, when COVID hit, I actually had everything set up with the academy. I just started it. So everything had to go virtual. And, you know, you always have to look at something positive out of everything all of our trips got canceled. As you know, we were yeah. all stuck at home with everybody else. And the virtual aspect was really the only way to connect. And I was already set up for that. So it was a blessing that I was because then I could just keep growing it that way. And, you know, some people just want to learn from the comfort of their house, but still be able yeah. to ask questions and talk. And of course, it's never as good as in person with the big hug, but <laughs> you got, it's good in other ways. So if someone wants to find out more about that, is that a separate website or is that from your main website that they would get there? How does a person go about? If they go to AngelaWolf.com and that there's no E at the end of that. A lot of people like to add an E to my name. It's AngelaWolf.com. And on the front page, they can click on the Academy, the patterns, any of the things okay. I've talked about will take them to those websites. Super cool. Well, I, I'm going to ask this again anyway. You can answer anything other than fishing. When you're not sewing, what other hobbies or interests uh, <laughs> do you have that you might be posting about on social media? Or what, what else interests Angela? Well, you know, the fishing takes up a lot of time. So that's like a big one. But I do have one other hobby that maybe a lot of people don't know about. And it's uh, playing the piano, which I've been doing since I was a young child. I write music, which I don't sell. That's just my own private thing to do. But I love playing the piano. Wow. Some people get all the talent. Jeez. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't say you'd want to hear me. I just I like to write music. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I always like to close with this one question and I ask this of everybody and I kind of, I've always said, you know, as an industry that we're not really selling thread and notions and fabric or patterns, but what we're really selling is this feeling of accomplishment and, and satisfaction that comes from creating. Do you believe that? And if, and if so, how, how has that feeling manifested itself in your particular journey? You know, that's kind of a double-edged sword because for myself and then what I see with other people for sewing, the feeling of accomplishment for sewing is amazing. In fact, I challenge myself every Wednesday. I have a live show at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And so that morning I come to the office and challenge myself to make a new top that day. Doesn't mean it's going to be hemmed for the show, but you can't see it. <laughs> so I always challenge myself just to do something quick and easy because I find in the garments that I make, if it's a couture jacket, that might take hundred hours. And you don't have, maybe you don't, you know, you don't have a hundred consecutive hours, but you want to finish something. And so I kind of mix my sewing with some easy making knit tops, some leggings, things like that, that I can whip out in a couple of hours. And then as I'm working on one of the more beautiful jackets or something like that, but when you finish any of them from a simple top to a couture jacket, there's just something about just now I kind of take it for granted that I wear all my own clothes, but every once in a while I'll go somewhere and someone will say, oh my gosh, what a great top. Where did you get that? I'm like, oh, I made it. Now I'm not, a, I'm, now I don't, I, 
I tell them right away, I made it. But I also watch when you're trying to finish a garment or you're working on a project, and I've been there too, where you finish it, it doesn't fit the way you wanted to. Maybe it didn't, you made a mistake somewhere or you didn't understand the instructions. I'm going back to when I remember making my first pair of pants. They were atrocious. They, <laughs> the crotch was down to the knee. And they look like MC Hammer pants. Now, if I was going for that look, they would have been perfect, but that's not where I was going. And so I can relate to people who just pick up a pattern, sew, and they don't know that maybe they should make a muslin to check the fit. Maybe, you know, check things as you sew. Don't just start at the beginning, sew to the end, and then you're so disappointed that you never want to sew again. Mm. Uh, And also the perfectionism. That's also a double-edged sword. I'm a huge perfectionist, but you also need to know, and I've had to teach myself when to say, okay, this is perfect enough. <laughs> because if you keep trying to make it perfect and then it maybe it will never become the your version of perfect. So perfectionism and just knowing when to walk away are probably the two biggest things for me are my how, biggest lessons. How do you help people get past those hiccups? You know, I mean, I can see what exactly what you're saying. You, you, you want people to enjoy their hobby and when they don't enjoy it, it's easy to walk away. How, how do you, what do you say to people in your classes when you're teaching? How do you get them to overcome that? Well, it's a fine line. You want them to learn the process, the right way of whatever they're sewing. If it's a certain way of sewing, if it's a certain fitting, if it's, you want them to learn the correct way of doing things, or at least my version of the correct way. I do it differently than many other people have done it. I just found through, I think it was my engineering mind that didn't work out so well. I'm going to do it this way. So I just share through my mistakes and I watch so many people say, Oh yeah, I did that. And now you showed me how not to do that. So I, I actually, I don't make them feel bad for making a mistake because you know what? It's just a design opportunity. Mm. I once sewed a beautiful suit, put my sleeves on backwards, <laughs> five minutes before my husband picked me up. And this suit had taken all day. It was gorgeous. I had to wear it. That's the only suit I had. I just got out of college. And so I stood all night with my arms arched back just so my sleeves didn't <laughs> And I received more compliments. I even got a few customers off that. They had no idea the sleeves were sewn on backwards. And <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to make things work. That's, that's. My there you go. Just tell them that story and boom, they've overcome their fears. Right. <laughs> I love it. At least hopefully. <laughs> well, Angela, I can't think of a, a more perfect uh, way to end the segment than, than that little piece of advice. I appreciate you being on today and for all of your time and for all you give to our industry. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Thank you for having me. And I'm very excited to listen to this podcast. Yeah, fantastic. Well, for all of our listeners, one more time, you can find out more about Angela, her patterns, the shows that she's on, her classes, all of that stuff at AngelaWolfNoe.com. And so hopefully you have some time to visit her. Thanks again, Angela. And we'll look forward to talking with you again soon. Thanks, Jason. Thank you for listening to Why So With Sulky. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and join us again for more fun stories that are sure to inspire your creativity. You can find more info and links for today's episode at sewingonline.sulky.com.